get through this today. We're going to try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last week, last time we, we were a little bit um, not as great getting through what we needed to get through, but we want to go through where Holy Spirit's got us, right? So we're in a series called The Four S's, um, From Survival to Significance. And I, I wanted to say there's four phases where, that you find yourself in life. One is survival. Um, the other is stability. Then there's success, and then there's significance. And I want to say right out that we, there's no condemnation for wherever you're at in whatever those phases. Maybe you're in absolute crisis survival mode. That's okay. We're teaching this so that you can get out of survival mode because God has big plans for you. So wherever you're at in this, our whole reason of doing this is to challenge you to take a step into the next phase. One step at a time. We don't go from survival to significance. We do the journey right? Say the journey. The journey. Yeah, not always fun, but that's how it works. And so we've, we've taught on survival. God wants us to not be in crisis mode. He wants us survival. Survival's good. It means you're not dead. It means you're actually waking up in the morning and getting through your day. After that, though, he wants us to be stable. We want to have stability, right? Stability is good. The problem with stability is stability is supposed to be a foundation for success. It's not supposed to be a stopping point. Okay? Now, the problem with stability is we can get really, really comfortable there. We can kind of camp out because finally you're not in crisis mode. This feels really good. When you've been in crisis mode long enough, stability just feels really good. Right? But I know I didn't grow up thinking, Lord, I just want a stable marriage. <laughs> I wanted an amazing marriage. Right? I want an amazing life, not just a stable life. And so it can be good and bad, and we can get stuck in our comfort of, um, of stability. But I want to push you forward to success. Now, the transition between stability and success is the hardest transition of all of these four transitions, which is why we're spending a couple weeks in here. This is a, there's, there's just a different way of thinking. There's a different way we have to respond. There's a different, some different things we've really got to get down in our hearts, in our minds, to move from stability into success. Because, so, yeah, yeah, go ahead. It, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So we've been talking about Ruth and, and her life. And if you have not had a chance to read the four chapters in that book, it is phenomenal because that, she went literally from a life of survival to a life of significance. And it's interesting the stages in her life. We're going to talk a little bit more about it here as we go on. But I want you to uh, hear this point. God's plan was never to have you just getting by. You are to be walking ambassadors of God's goodness, his mercy and his favor and his generosity. So I like what John 10, 10 says that he didn't come that we would have an average life, but it was supposed to be how? Abundant. Everybody say abundant. Abundant. Say that sounds like my life. Sounds like my See, life. See, for some of you, you even have a hard time saying that. Well, I don't feel my life is there right now. I know. Start speaking it and see what God's. But I want you to see the definition of the word blessed. First Peter 4.14, the Amplified says blessed. In brackets, are you happy, fortunate, and to be envied with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation? See, the English language doesn't give you the understanding of what blessed means until you break it down. Happy, fortunate, and to be envied. Are you getting that? That's what God's called you. And he says, not only that, it will, it will give you life, joy, and peace, and my salvation that comes with it. Some, some of you need to start, you know, when someone says, hey, how are you doing? We go, oh, good, or fine. We all need to start saying, I'm blessed. When you start understanding what blessed means, you know, uh, when we were in Canada, uh, Ralph, had, you had to have license plates on the front of your car and the back of your car in Canada. And um, he, he got a license plate called blessed. I still and have so, it. Yeah. yeah. So his whole thing was, he says, I, I've always confessed that I'm blessed coming and I'm blessed going, right? So, <laughs> but what if we just start confessing over our lives of, you know what, I'm blessed. I live a blessed life and start changing our confession over our lives as well as our mentality. Now, God wants to do more for you and through you than you can even imagine. Stop thinking small. 
right? It's not enough for us to just get by. We've got to start realizing that God has such big plans for each and every one of us that we've got to start being willing to break out of this stable mode and go into areas of success in every area of our life, not just our finances, but in our families, in our, in our mental health, in our physical health, in our finances, all of it. But we should be going into a success mode in all of these. So now, we talked about this, and we're going to just do these two in review real quick. If you missed it, go back from two weeks ago and listen to it. But it's how do we step into success? And so the first point we had is you need to change the way you think and speak. And change poverty thinking to abundance thinking. Speak life and not death. So there's two practical tools we have here for you. Last week we handed them out and they're out um, at the back again. This is called my daily success declaration. And it's taking Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14, and it's personalizing it for your life. Okay, and so I, I challenge you, if, especially if you've been really struggling with a success mentality, um, I encourage you to take this and just start declaring it over yourself. It's scripture. It will change things. The other thing, um, and we didn't have them for last time, we, we've got the shipment now. There's a, a book that really changed our lives, and it's called God Wants You to Be Rich by um, Paul uh, Pilzer. 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 And uh, he got a hold of this book back in the day when we were struggling with the mentality of you know, the whole God wants you poor or everything else. And this really changed our mindset. So as we said, some of us have got to retrain our mind in order to get the results we want to see. And so we ordered some of, I think we've only got about 24 or 25 books, um, and they're $20 out in the lobby. So we just ordered it to make it easy for you guys. Um, and uh, you can grab one of those and get the word into you. But the, sec uh, the second thing, is there's no get-rich-quick scheme. It requires diligence and hard work, right? Success doesn't happen accidentally. So um, we're going to go into number three tonight. Number three is be a faithful steward of what you currently have. Okay, so this is a success. How do we become successful? Number three, we become a faithful steward of what we currently have. Let's look at Luke 16.10. The one who faithfully manages the little he has been given will be promoted and trusted with greater responsibilities. But those who cheat with the little they have been given will not be considered trustworthy to receive more. Ouch. They're really quiet tonight. It is. Um, <laughs> They're thinking. The online crowd I can hear is <laughs> cheering behind them. But. but you know, there's something about this that is really, really... Um, true. I still remember we had been praying for our, we had been living here in Florida in our winter home, trying to buy a dream home. And we had been trying like year after year after year. I mean, I can't even, I don't even know how many offers we went through and, and fell apart or denied, whatever else. And um, it had been about nine, 10 years. And the Lord finally dealt with me of, you're wanting something, but are you faithful with what you currently have? And I was like, what does that mean? He says, well, you're believing for a house. Are you faithful with what you currently have? And the Lord started dealing with me of treat my home like I'm going to live here forever. Treat my home like it is the best place ever. And I started fixing things up. We started redesigning things, uh, not to get it ready for sale, but because I needed to be a good steward. And uh, we had put a house, an offer on a house and uh, they, you know, we lowballed it. It was a short sale. We were like, oh, well, lowball it, you know, and then we'll barter with the bank. Well, they uh, said, absolutely not. You insulted us. We're never going to talk to you again. Click. We're like, okay now, okay. But <laughs> anyhow, so a, a few weeks goes by and the Lord's like, will you be a good steward of what you have? I'm like, God, I'm trying, okay. But our garage was an issue, a big issue. We have a triple garage and it was, we had one pathway that did not have stuff from our house door out the garage door. Nobody here can really relate to that. Okay. So we're not, it's not hitting hard on anybody. Either. Okay. So, and we're talking like this high, solid stuff. And, and the Lord just started dealing with me. We said, we got to clean that out. Well, we started cleaning it out and probably half of the stuff, if not more, had to get thrown away. We found a rat living in there that was literally... My boys brought out their BB guns and, you know, they took care of it. 
But we had been obviously bad stewards. Well, we got about three quarters of the way through cleaning that out and being a good steward of what we had. And the agent called us back and says, we're going to take your offer. Come on. We, you know, but that is a spiritual principle of will you be a faithful steward of what you have while you wait for what God wants to do, right? Be faithful with the finances you have now while you wait for increase. Be faithful with the car you have right now while you wait for a new one, right? So we have to be faithful with what we have. Now, here's a point. There's a small price to pay now for a greater reward later. It takes great discipline to go from stability to success. I want to share something that Dave Ramsey shared. If you've if ever heard of him, he mm-hmm. kind of teaches financial principles. And he said this, a third of the millionaires never made six figures in any single year of their career. What you actually do with the money you make matters more than the amount of money you make. There are plenty of people making a lot of money who live paycheck to paycheck. So what's the, what can we learn from this is live below your means. People who make the shift from stability to success always live below their means. So what happens to a lot of people is when they get a job and they're doing well and then they get promoted and then they get promoted. Hey, I need a new car. Hey, I need a new house. Come on, somebody. And what do they do? They get into more debt. I had somebody just come to me recently and they said, you know, I'm struggling to make payments, but I'm thinking of buying a house for $100,000 more than mine currently is. Come on, you need a checkup from the neck up because if you're struggling, why would you incur another $100,000 worth of debt? There's no imag- a magical fairy that'll make all of this. Just See, God gives us things and he wants us to be good stewards in what we are given. Are you getting this? See, a lot of times when extra comes in, oh, well, I can just do this and I can just do that. I talked to uh, an accountant one time and she explained to me, she says, I took my house, but it went up in value so much, I put a mortgage on it and then I went on vacation and I bought a boat. Come on, people, do you have any return on those things? And I looked at her and I said, well, don't you understand? I mean, you're the educated one. I said, don't you understand you actually have to pay that back? See, I said, if you had taken that and invested into something that would have had a chance of multiplying, it makes some sense. Yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Don't look at me like, I, who's this guy? What's he talking about? This is the church, people. God has given us abilities to do things, but we have to be obedient in them. Right. And it requires discipline. Today, discipline is like almost like a curse word. <laughs> don't, don't tell me how to live. But see, God's saying if you want the best of the land, if you want, you have to get in and start disciplining yourself with what you currently already have. I think we have to kind of shift of the paycheck to paycheck mentality and start realizing where can I cut back? And maybe your, your income is low enough where it's, um, there's not a let, not left over. Well, what can you start cutting back? Maybe not having a Starbucks every single day. I know that hurts some people. Maybe not dining out. Maybe you take a season where you, you're just wise with your money, where you decide, you know what, I need something in the bank for a little while. I'm going to take a season. You know, last time we shared how we did this for a two-year period of time. We decided, you know what, we wanted to hit that million-dollar mark, and we were going to do whatever it took. And we were going to believe God for new opportunities. We were going to save every extra penny we possibly could. We only shopped at Goodwill and secondhand stores for clothing, um, for anything, actually. Um, and even when our income started going up, we didn't increase our, our, our way of living. So there's a point where we have to realize we have to sometimes sacrifice some things in order to be able to get to a place. Where the Lord told us in that is he says, you know what, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a business, for an investment, and you're not going to have anything to put towards it if you don't start planning now, right? So you don't know at what point God could give you that God idea and you haven't got two cents to rump together because you've been living, you know, more extravagantly. So why not take the time right now to prepare? And you might not have much to put aside. Put whatever you can aside, And God can start multiplying your efforts, right? But when he sees you're being faithful and being prayerful over 
not having to get every single thing your hearts desire. You know, our kids grew up not getting everything they wanted, even though we had the money to do it, because we wanted them to understand the principle of living below our means, of, of working for things, of being appreciative let, of let, those let things. Let me give a practical thing, because I don't, I don't think I've ever shared this, but when the kids were little, we used to, when we lived in Canada, the, Canada, the government there would send your kids money if you were under a certain income level, and so we would always take that money and put it in accounts. And so each of the kids had accounts, and then my dad would give money, and birthday money or whatever, and we would just put the money in the bank accounts. And so after a series of number of years, we had about $7,000 saved up. And uh, I was, I mean, then being in the real estate business, I find this house that was a really good deal for $35,000. And I said, I think we should buy this house with the kids' money. Just wait for it. Because we want to set them up for something. And when they're three and five and eight, they don't see the value of it. But if we could get something for them and invest it, and, and, and we rented it out, and all the money that came for rent went strictly to pay off the mortgage. So within a very short period of time, seven years, that house was paid for. Now watch this. The market increased. And when we sold the house, it was worth $80,000. That's not a bad return. I mean, it's not great for seven years or eight years, but it was undervalued. But so the interesting thing is when the kids stepped out now to buy houses, I was able to give them $20,000. And people say, it's really nice that you gave your kids money. I said, no, you don't understand. It wasn't my money. I just managed it on behalf of them until the time came. And when they needed a house, they got $20,000. No, but you gave it to them. So I can't get intelligent life form every time I talk to people. Are you with me? <laughs> No, I invested on their behalf. I was a steward of what that was already theirs, and it multiplied. See, God is looking for unique, creative things to do in people's lives, but you have to get to the point where you say, I'm going to just step out when God tells me to do something. So I want to take this into different realms of our life. You know, as you start to succeed, don't spend everything you make. Just because you get a, a pay increase does not mean you have to live in a bigger house. Doesn't mean you have to go out more. Start taking that increase and putting it away. You know, if, as your marriage starts to succeed, don't stop at stable. Don't stop there. Go for more. Man. You know, we are big advocates of, man, when, when you have a healthy marriage, you keep learning wow. because it can get better. Right? So don't stop at stable. Keep going. Keep going forward. You know, as you get healed of something, don't stop. Go for a healthier lifestyle. Yeah. Right? There's always those points in every area of our life that tends to be that when we hit stability, when we finally kind of get our answer, we stop. But no, we're saying you got to keep going. Keep going for more um, and get to that success point. Here's another point before we move on to this. But don't consume your success for your own pleasure alone. Success is meant to be the ladder on your journey to significance. It's meant to be the ladder. In other words, success is just the stepping stone God wants you to take to get to significance, which we're going to talk about next time. So number four, it says, here's the fourth point. Put feet to your faith. Act like you actually believe what you say you believe. Now, what, listen to this. James chapter 2 and verse 20, it says, the fact is faith has to show itself through works performed in faith. If you don't recognize that, you're an empty soul. In other words, you have a part to play in it to, to watch success happen. Because God says that everything your hands touch is, oh, it's quiet in here. Everything your hands touch is blessed. Everywhere you put your foot, you haven't been reading that Psalm to, or, or Deuteronomy 28. Everywhere you put your foot, you'll take the ground. See, if you don't take the ground and you don't put your hands on it, it won't be blessed. The blessing flows through you. It doesn't, the object isn't blessed. You are blessed, and when you touch it, it multiplies. Somebody's going to get this. You carry the blessing. The covenant is with you, not with objects. Yeah. So when you put your hands on something, God says, I want you to step into this. You're like, ha, 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 ha. Come on, we get nervous. But when we get obedient, and when we do it, all of a sudden what happens, it will multiply. Because if you're saying you have the faith to succeed, but you're not actually taking steps to succeed... And to take steps that are needed to change or whatever else, then you truly don't have faith that you're meant to succeed, 
right? So it takes the action step of it. But James 2.18, it says, but someone might object and say, one person has faith and another person has works. Go ahead then and prove to me that you have faith without works and I will show you faith by my works as proof that I believe. Good. Faith by my works as proof that I believe. If you believe God wants you to succeed and move you to a greater level, what are you doing to prove that you believe that? Okay? What are you doing to prove that God wants you to move forward? Are you saving that little bit of money because you know that at the right time, God's going to bring you an opportunity? Or are you just settled with, well, you know what? I can't ever move ahead. I'm just going to do what I have to do. I'm just going to survive here. What are you doing to move yourself forward? You know, are you actively looking for opportunities in, you know, within the realm of finances? Are you actively saying, God, I am praying for that God opportunity, that God idea? Are you actively like, okay, what is it? And then when that crazy idea comes, are you willing to act on it? You know, if you're looking for an amazing, significant marriage, are you taking the steps towards what you have to do to change? right? We always want to blame the other person, but many times it's us, right? Are we learning? Are we getting better? Are we treating our spouse differently, right? All of those things. If you believe that a successful marriage and a thriving marriage is supposed to be what you are, what are you doing to get there, okay? It's one thing to just pray, God, change that man, change that woman, my goodness. But the question should be, what are we doing, to do our part to make sure that this marriage thrives, right? Yeah. So to be praying for something but not taking steps means you don't actually have the faith to believe that God will actually give you success in that area, yeah. okay? Now, another so, point here is you, need, you don't need to tell everyone what your plans are. In fact, you should protect your God dreams. If God shows you a way of, of getting increased, maybe in the area of, a lot of times I call it the three degree shift. It's in front of you, you just can't see it. And all of a sudden God shows you in a dream what you need to do. Maybe you need to be like, uh, like the woman when, when, when her husband passed away and the prophet said, take whatever you have and close the door. Sometimes you and I have to close the door, close our mouth and not tell everybody what, what the deal is because otherwise people will steal the dream. Are you hearing me? If God whispered in your ear, it might have been to promote you, not to promote the other people. Just saying. Well, that's selfish. No, that's God. God. God blesses. You ask him for a blessing and then he gives it to you. Sometimes you just need to step out in it, not announce it to everybody, but say, this is what we're doing as a family. And maybe talk to your kids and your wife. Make sure your wife's in agreement, obviously. Uh, don't go doing something without <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, don't keep each other from your spouse. Yeah. We're going to move on to number five. So now you've been looking for that God opportunity. You've been faithful with what you're doing. You're, you've been acting like you're, you're, you're meant to step into success. Then number five comes. It says, step out in obedience, even if it's way outside your comfort zone. You see, success requires obedience. It requires risk. I don't know about you, but I don't like risk. Yeah. Women, we like stability. We like knowing, you know, that we're going to be okay. We're, you know, I'm a planner. I want to know what's going to happen in all the next 25 million steps. And um, so that risk is something we've got to learn to trust God in. And I look at the story of Ruth. Um, I encourage you to read through it all. But in Ruth, you know, she's in absolute crisis mode. Her husband's died. Um, she's her, her father-in-law's died. She goes, leaves her homeland with Naomi to go to uh, where the, the Jewish people were in Bethlehem to be able to just to survive. All of a sudden then she's working Boaz's field, Boaz's field. She's getting favor and they're able to take home, you know, enough grain for her and Naomi. They're doing well, right? They've had favor. But then Naomi tells her one day, because now she's stable, then Naomi tells her, you know what? I want you to go lay while Boaz sleeps. Go lay on his feet. Go lay at his feet. And that's the sign to see if he'll take you as his wife and, and redeem you and marry you as a, a, a family member of your father-in-law. Well, you know, this all sounds great when we read it now, but there's a lot of risk in that. A lot of risk. Because now, I mean, things are stable. They can eat. They're doing okay. But if I go and do this and he rejects me, I'll be kicked out of his field. 
I could be kicked out and not have a place to go. I could have a reputation where all the other farmers will not let me glean from their fields. Right? Her, her self-esteem could have been hit. Man, he doesn't, you know, because they say uh, Naomi was, a, or um, Ruth was about 40 and Boaz was about 80 at the time. Okay? So she could be rejected. She's a hot little item. Though, yeah. <laughs> and, and feel kind like. Kind of like you, babe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anyhow. That's but, a quick save, right? <laughs> But she could have felt this massive, deep rejection from someone. He, she could have, all kinds of things could have gone wrong. And it could have been so easy for her to say, you know what, Naomi, it's really just, we're doing okay here. Like, we're really doing okay. But if she hadn't done that, she wouldn't have been accepted by Boaz. And she wouldn't have given birth to the descendants of Jesus. And all those things that are the significant part of her life. She had to take a risk. And there's a point where you and I, if we want to move into success, we're going to have to take a risk. God tells us this crazy idea. And all of a sudden it's like, ah, that doesn't make sense. Well, you know what? If God's in it, it doesn't have to make sense. You just got to step out. Because a God idea usually doesn't make sense. It's usually a whole lot of, I have no idea how to do that. And a whole lot of, okay, God, I got to trust you and you're going to be the one to do it. Amen. What is it they say? They said, if you can accomplish it on your own, it's not big enough for God, right? We need a god side idea. We need a god sized thing to step into, and that's when he shows up, and you can take that step into full success. Listen to this, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. This is Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, go away from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you abundantly and make your name great, exalted and distinguished. And I will bless or do good for the benefit of those who bless you and I will curse that is subject to my wrath and judgment the ones who curse you, despise you or dishonor you, who contempt for you. And in you all the families, the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, Abraham had it good. He was a wealthy guy. He didn't have a family. His, his wife, Sarah, couldn't bear children. But he had it good. He was well-connected in the Jewish cartel. Come on, somebody. You ever notice how they do business? They help each other out. Christians could learn something from that. They go out of their way to help each other out. So you're connected. And a lot of times the family's intermarried to keep the connection strong. So God says, okay, Abram, I'm going to do something big. So I need you to pack up, cut all your connections, cut all your favor, cut everything that you know that works really well. I need you to pack up and take your family and your, your, your crew with you. How many people think that's not a good idea? Sarah was thinking, oh, great, I get to live all the stability behind in my house and I get to go live in a tent. Come on, ladies. But God asked them to do it. He says, I have a bigger plan for your life, but it's going to have to take you getting out of what you think is what your, your ability is and how your connections are so that I can step you into what I really have planned for your life so that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Can you imagine that? He doesn't even have kids. God, God hello, God, hello, hello, hello. He's in the echo chamber. You're doing what? But he had to be obedient. See, if he wouldn't have been obedient, we wouldn't be calling him Father Abraham today. He probably wouldn't have had a kid. God would have said, all right, who's next on the list? Come on, somebody. But the interesting thing is, he, God just told him to go. He didn't give him the plan, didn't even tell him where he was going to go. He just said, go. And Abraham went. And as he went, the Lord started showing him where to go. Isn't that kind of freaky? <laughs> Like God said, start that business. You're kind of like, okay, how do we, you know, how do we do that? Or invest in this, you know, house. Well, how am I going to handle that? Well, I don't know. You know, start reaching out to that person. Start doing this. Start taking advantage of that. Opportunity. Well, how do I do that? I don't know. But you know, it's that step of obedience. And obedience to go to a new level is never in your comfort zone. Never, ever. Um, let, look at this. If you've always lived in survival or stability, success will be outside your comfort zone. It will require faith to step into a new level. Be ready and willing to get uncomfortable. Yay! 
right? We love uncomfortable. Here's a few examples. To be a successful speaker, you'll need to first stand in front of people and talk. Yeah, I didn't like that the first time. I'll tell you that right now. To be a successful parent, you're going to have to first have children that you don't know what to do with. Right? To be financially successful, you'll need to take risks and step, steps that could threaten your stability. Okay? That switch is you're going to feel uncomfortable. It's when God's calling you into bigger things, you know, and even in ministry, God calls you to start a small group. God starts calling you to minister to your neighbors, and you're like, whoa, that's not me. But you know what? To go to a new level, it's always going to feel uncomfortable until you learn that new level. Guess what? Then that level will be eventually get comfortable, and he'll challenge you and take you to a new one, right? He never wants us to be so comfortable that he's not challenging us for more. I'll just tell you, it's a lot more exciting when we do life a little bit uncomfortable because it means we have to rely on the Lord all that much more. And he never stops showing up when we trust him and we're obedient. So new levels always take a while to adjust. So we're going to be like, ah, that's okay. Okay? I want you to say it. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay, right? As I said, it's about our calling, not our comfort. We say that often. Number six. Be planted or fully committed in a healthy church. Psalm 92, verses 12 and 13, it says, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Now, I want you to know something, that when you and I become planted into something, it's not easy to uproot you. Are you hearing this? See, a lot of people live potted lives. Well, I like that message over here, so guess what? I'm, I'm going over here. Oh, there's somebody else new over here, and they got a good message for me too. And watch this. They're moving around. How deep can those roots go if it stays in a pot? It stunts the growth. The Bible says that when you and I get planted, everybody say planted, planted. in the house of the Lord, we will flourish. Well, here's the problem. The devil will get after you sometimes and, 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 and you hear a message that isn't popular to what's going on in your life. And the Holy Spirit's nudging you, hey, you need to forgive that person. And you're thinking, that knucklehead doesn't deserve forgiveness. Come on, somebody. Why do I feel pressured like I'm supposed to forgive that person? Who, is the church pressuring the people? Who is? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to get you out of kindergarten to grade one. Well, I don't like that message. Come on, we go like this and all of a sudden you will miss what God has for you. Because when you get planted in the house of the Lord where it's healthy, where people's lives are getting touched and changed, where miracles are happening, you just realize you're next. Are you hearing me? Sometimes, and that's why we share this even when we tell people after they've been so many months at the church, you're going to feel and all of a sudden, I want to quit and I just need to get out of here. I, I don't know I, 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 why, because the Holy Spirit has loved you and wined and dined you. And now he's asking you to kind of work on some areas of your life. I really don't like when he does that to me. Come on, let's all be honest. But when we want to grow, he will prune us. He will get us so we will bear more fruit because if we don't change, nothing will change. Because what's the definition of habitual insanity? Keep doing the same thing, hoping for a different result. It doesn't work. So God's working on our lives. He says, I'm going to help them get past this because when they get past this, their kids will never get stuck. You ever notice people that will hold grudges or they get stuck in something and they won't pass it, their kids carry it the same way. For the, the love of your children, just get past it. Come on. You don't need your kids to have the same bad attitude that you have. Oh, it's quiet in here. Let me trick to this side. I said, you don't need your kids to have the same bad attitude that you have. You want them to get past it because otherwise they're stuck in kindergarten. They never get to grade one. See, when we realize that God's trying to take us on a journey to, to, to take our lives to a whole new level, we got to realize, okay, God, let's shake the junk off. Let's carve it off, even though it might hurt. 
Even though I like doing that, come on, I would say, don't try sin, you might like it. Look at this. Often, this is a warning for us all, okay? Often in success mode, people don't need God and walk away. God cares about your spiritual life more than your financial life. Always keep your need for God above all else. This is why some people don't even hit success mode because God knows that as soon as you hit success, you're going to walk away from church or you'll walk away from God. We've seen this too many times. People are struggling, struggling, struggling. God finally comes through for them. They get all this breakthrough and then they suddenly are too busy to come to church anymore. They're too busy to spend time with God. I I've graduated they crash. that now, Pastor. Yeah. And, and that's where we have to understand is it's that trusted with little, you'll be trusted with much. Will you serve God full-heartedly when you're in survival mode as much as when you're in success mode? right? When it's good, you should be praising God. When it's bad, we should be praising God, right? We should be faithful. It doesn't matter where we are in this spectrum. We should be faithful to him and realize that he is the most crucial part. He is the source for everything. And if we lose sight of that, we will step out of the God kind of success and we will never hit significance if we don't get this right. Okay, we have to have God in the center as the source of everything. Now, we're going to try and get through these last two really quick. Good yes. luck. Okay. Well, actually, we, we, yeah, we've already got planted here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to number seven. Number seven, yes. Number seven, be a tither and a giver. This is one of the biggest keys of success in all of your areas. You might think, well, that's just for, t that's just for money. No, this is for every area of your life that this is a key. Okay, um, the Lord's sh prayer shows us, right, as we talked about earlier, that he will provide your essential living needs, right? Give us this day our daily bread. But God's got so much more. He wants to bring abundance to you. And the only way to get to abundance in any area of your life is by having this principle of tithing. So let's read it. Malachi 3, 10 to 11. Bring all the tithes, the tenth into the storehouse, so that there may be... Which is the local church food in my house and test me now in this says the Lord of hosts if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there is no more room to receive it then I will rebuke the devourer the insects the plagues for your sake and he and and he will not destroy the fruits of the ground nor will your vine uh, in the field drop its grapes before harvest says the Lord of hosts. So I want you to see something first because they're talking farming terms and if you're off the farm, you're like, what are they talking about? Well, they, when they were farmers, if, if, their, if their crops failed, it wasn't a good year. It was they their were, livelihood. It, it was their livelihood. So what is the tithe does? Number one, it opens the windows of heaven. So how are the windows before you tithe? Closed. Thank you. We have our hand on that window. By tithing, we open. I want to just first say this. God doesn't want to hold anything back from you. He does not want to hold a single blessing back from you. But it's all backlogged and we have to operate in obedience. And by opening that window, God's finally like, finally, <laughs> I can get to them what I was wanting to get to them. Now, part of the thing is in this is it also takes the legal right away from the devil to steal from you. This is huge. Because how many people feel that they've been doing everything right and, and tithing and they've been doing stuff but then all of a sudden the car breaks down unexpectedly. All of a sudden the dishwasher stops working, the air conditioning stops working at home and you're like, hello, this should have never happened. Come on somebody. If the tires are bald because you drove them off, then, then that's a whole different story. But let's say you've maintained everything and all of a sudden things happen. The devil is still a thief. The thief still comes to kill, steal and destroy. But the Bible says here when you're a tither that the devourer has been rebuked. If he took from you, he did it illegally if you're a tither. Now Proverbs 6, 30 and 31, we don't have the scripture for it. But it says if a thief is caught, he must give up sevenfold of his household even, or sevenfold back even if it costs him his whole household. In other words, if the devil takes from you and you are a tither, 
That means 10% of your income goes to your local church. You have legal rights in that and you can go to the high courts of heaven and declare and release that money back to you by what you release and what you say because you have to catch the thief. You notice what Proverbs 6, 30 and 31, if you catch the thief. So when you and I catch the thief now, he's not giving back what he took. He's giving back seven times what he took. This is important for us to realize because people say, I don't, I don't, I, pastors say, I, I can't talk about money at church. I said, well, how are they going to get a breakthrough? Come on, somebody. Go to unsaved places that just tell the people to do dumb things. Or you want to hear the, the favor of the Lord and how God operates. If you don't hear it from church, where are you going to hear it from? Listen, I was broke and I took the word of God and I applied it to my life and all of a sudden God started walking us through one level of success after another level of success after another level of success. And believe me, success is kind of fun. Amen. No, it's really fun. Because all of a sudden what you couldn't accomplish, you can now accomplish because God's supernatural favor comes up. You think differently. You don't look at problems like problems. All of a sudden you see there's answers to them. And God will increase and he always gives more and more and more. He never puts a hold on you. In fact, what came out of God's lips to Adam, who was the wealthiest man that ever lived on the earth. Adam. First words out of his, out of his mouth, you can have more. Genesis 1.28, be blessed and multiply. He already had everything he needed. Why would he need to multiply? Come on, people. I say God's a God of increase. I say God's a God of increase. Somebody's going to catch this. God wants to multiply what comes into your hands. He wants to give you the ground when you take it. But are you going to step out in that? See, when you're tither, you have a different mentality. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, oh he took from me? I, I don't think that's going to happen. Let me tell you something about the devil. He's really conniving in what he does. But when you catch him with his pants down and you take seven times what he's taken for, they mark you, don't mess with this one. She's got a bad attitude when you steal from her and she'll take us to the high courts of heaven. See, when you go to the high courts of heaven, there's no sleight of hand. There's no cheating in the court system. Your heavenly father's the judge and Jesus is your attorney. I mean, it doesn't get better. The cards are stacked in your favor. And when you release the power, all of a sudden the supernatural gets released. And all of a sudden manifested miracles start coming. How did that happen? Well, I'm just a child of God. I'm just an ambassador of heaven. I mean, of course it would happen to me. I'm a covenant kid with covenant promises. Amen. You know where the church has missed it? They won't take the promises God has for them. I usually offend them to get their attention. I say, can I have yours? Come on, somebody. Sometimes you need a up the side of the head. Oh, that's mine. See, we don't even believe that God wants to bless us. It's quiet in here. I should be getting some shouts of amen. Come on, God. Let's go. God is more interested in you succeeding than you are interested in succeeding yourself. Yeah. Amen. You represent him. You're his ambassador. Oh, there's my, bro there's my broke ambassador. Come on, somebody. <laughs> trying to collect welfare. Trying to make it. No, he says you'll have everything in abundance till it overflows out of your hands exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Come on, you're thinking too small and that's why you won't even go take what... The children of Israel have the same problem. God said, go take the land and seven of the tribes of, of Israel wouldn't go. Five of them went and took... In fact, the, the tribe of Dan took so much they couldn't even control it. You know, God never said, hey, greedy, stop. He said, take it. And they actually took it. You, you look at Joshua. He had to go back and give the seven a pep talk. Out and go. And some of the other ones had to step in and actually drag them through the blessing. Come on, people. If you only knew how God wants to bless your life, you'll start saying, this is going to be good. You will change how you think. You will change what you say. I'm chasing rabbits here. Yeah. Sorry, He's at it again. I will just point out, though, because once again, we can think that tithing only opens the windows for financial. It doesn't. The devourer rebuked is over every part of your life when you're a tither. I have prayed over girls multiple times who are in the middle of miscarriages and stood on this scripture and said, no, as a tither, the devourer is rebuked. He will not destroy this child, and those miscarriages stop. 
Come on. You guys, this is, this is like he cannot mess with your marriage. He cannot mess with your family. He cannot mess with your children. He cannot mess when you understand your authority as a tither. Amen. Okay? So I want to, we're going to quickly cover this last bit of this. But tithing opens the window of heaven, but giving determines the outpour. I want to show you this. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God lives a, loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You know, this is... This is the point where you start getting gutsy, where, yeah, I'm tithing. That's, that's a big step. I know for a lot of people, that's a big step. But now you start giving a little bit more. Man, that's where it starts getting really good. That's where it takes greater faith. Look at this. Tithing shows your obedience, but giving shows your heart. You know, if your good. heart is really to go after God, you'll, go after, you, you'll give whatever he says. It's all his anyhow, right? If he's truly our source, then it's his. Um, and, and he'll tell you what to give. I'm not telling you everybody go out and give 90% of your income away unless God told you to do that. But I know God has done for us. He's put us in a double, we're in a double giving challenge right now where we're doubling our tithe. Plus, because he challenged us, oh, I want to do more through you and in you. So you got to give more, right? And so just considering of what God wants to do, but that shows on your heart. Now look at Luke 6, 38. Give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you, shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of generosity becomes the measurement of your return. As I said, this is a stretch, getting out of comfort zone sometimes. This is a new level when we, we start going past tithing and going, okay, God, you know what? I want more. You know, one, one principle that, that we had started using years ago, when we were in just understanding all of this too and, and wanting to see God move, we actually made faith tithes with our giving. We would tithe on our income, and then many times when we were dealing for it, waiting for a deal to come through or we were waiting for something, let's say it was $20,000 breakthrough or inheritance or whatever else it was that we were waiting for and it was getting held up, we would, give, we would give an offering of $2,000. We're like, by faith, I'm claiming that as ours. And then when it came in, we'd also tithe on that as well. But you know what? God started seeing our obedience and started seeing, wow, that's a step of faith. That's a step of faith. What if it doesn't come through, right? I know um, one friend of ours actually did this. They were, looking for a th they were waiting for a $3 million business deal to come through. And they gave an offering of $300,000 as a faith tithe. And you know, that, that I mean, that's a, guts, that's a big one, right? Because <laughs> I mean, it, it looked like it was going all kinds of sideways. They said, Lord, we're just declaring by faith that that is ours and we're going to put action behind it to say that we're going to succeed in this. And that deal came together. And then he gave another 10% on top of that right? But, but just understand that as God leads you, and this is not a rule, this is where God needs to lead you and where your heart needs to be in it because of his faithfulness. But I want to finish on this point here. Don't consume your success for your own pleasure alone. Success is meant to be the ladder on your journey to significance. Okay, this success is simply we get to a point, it's not a landing spot, but it's really important we hit this. We can't be significant in our finances if we haven't hit success in our finances. We can't be significant in our marriages if we haven't been successful in our marriages. We can't be sig significant in our family lives if we haven't been successful in our family lives. You getting it? Spiritually, we need to be fully healthy. We need to understand in our minds, have healthy minds, have healthy bodies, all of these things in every single area, but success is not a landing point. And we're going to be talking about significance next time, and it's exciting. Because how many of you guys know God's got a big thing for you? Amen. Amen. Every single one of you. There's not one person he doesn't have a plan that's supposed to be significant and take you to a new level. You know, I want to just, um, as, as we're wrapping up, I want to share this so you get this. Because that's why we left the offering for them. We wanted you to hear the word. When, when the word is released, it, it always helps. So we're not here to manipulate you for money. We're not a broke church. 
Come on, people. We're not begging for money because that's not what God would ever do is beg or manipulate anybody for anything. He wants to give you an opportunity to participate in what the blessing is. You know, I really love what the scripture says because you might be saying, sitting there, man, I'm tithing. That's been a stretch for me. I'd really like to offer, but I don't, I, I don't have the money to do that. You know, the Bible says God gives seed to the sower. Why don't you petition God to give you some seed that you can sow? He says he'll give you seed to sow. This is powerful because he wants you to step in this level of abundance in your life. And sometimes we get to the point where I, I just, I, I don't know. People that, you, that don't, don't come to church or don't understand God, oh, they called you into taking your money. Listen, I want to tell you up front, we don't need your money. God's got more than enough. But when you want to walk in what God has, you've got to do what God tells you to do. So petition him, ask him for seed. Well, I don't know what that is. You, you get between God and you pray about it. It's not, we're not here to manipulate for anything because we're not that church. We've never been a broke church and we don't plan on being a broke church. Amen? Amen. We believe that God's favor and blessing comes on people's lives and they'll, they, it will multiply and come in abundance into their lives. But the number one thing is making sure your life is right with God. Because people say, well, I want all the benefits. I said, wait, wait a minute. You're a child because kids get the benefits. If you're in the fam, if you're in the family, you get the blessings. Outside the family, you don't. So how do you come into the family? It's simple. I'm glad you asked. You have to ask Jesus to come into your life, forgive you of your sins. And I'm going to pray a prayer right now. There's people online watching and you're, you've been, God's been pulling on your heart through the whole service. And there's even people here that like God are saying, get your life right with me today. You know, it doesn't only guarantee you heaven, but it lets, it lets you live a life of blessing on the earth here today as well. It didn't say your life's going to be perfect. It didn't say everything's always going to go the way you want it to go. But it, God will always, will always show up and bless your life in multiple different ways. I want to pray this prayer, and I'm just going to ask everybody to repeat it after me. And if that's you, say it online. Even if there's people in the room with you, just tune in with God. The prayer goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you come into my me. life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And help me to live for you. Help me to live every for day of my life. Every day of my in life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.